Did you know that there are many airlines that won't let you board their flight without a valid return ticket to your home country? Or you want to learn more about how to avoid those crazy and excessive Airbnb prices for your next apartment? Are you unsure if your budget is going to work out in your next destination? Or where can you find accurate visa information and how long you can legally stay in your country? There are so many things you have to keep in mind before making the move to your next exotic destination. But with the proper organization, you can really make it hassle-free and prepare your next trip the perfect way. Hey guys, my name is Goran, I'm 30 years old and I'm a digital nomad. This video is being made in one of the most famous digital nomad hostels in Latin America, in the Selena chain in Bogota in Colombia. The goal of today's video is to discuss all the important parts of how to plan an amazing trip as a digital nomad, but also as a traveler. After today's video, you will have all the necessary information on how to plan a smooth trip and save money while doing so. In today's video, we will talk about the six most important parts on how to plan a trip so that everything works out the perfect way for you. The six categories are budget, visas, accommodation, flights, money, and travel insurance. After watching this video, you will have all the necessary information on how to prepare yourself, maybe as a beginner or even already as an advanced digital nomad, on maybe to learn something new and apply this into your new lifestyle. But before we start with this amazing content, I would kindly remind you to please subscribe on my channel, to leave a like or a comment after the video. Let's start with the budgeting. Why is budgeting so important and why do we start with that? Yes, actually, if you are making two or three thousand US dollars per month, chances are you're probably not going to live in New York City or in Miami because the cost of living is way too high. In the beginning, you probably won't be making way too much money. You're making five, six, seven K US dollars. So most people stick first to Southeast Asia or Latin America or East Europe. Now we already have the first problem. Where do I get reliable information about the cost of living in a new destination? Luckily, our digital nomad colleagues have everything prepared for you already. There's an amazing page called www.nomadlist.com where you can find all the necessary information ranked with safety, cost of living, internet speed, anything you might need. On Nomadlist you can find lots of data which is very interesting and very helpful for you. And one of my experiences is when you see the prices there, trust me, in my own experience the cost of living has actually been lower than shown on their destinations. After having collected the data on nomadlist.com I'm recommending you to do more research. For example, in the local Facebook groups, you can get up-to-date information from people currently living in those destinations. It might happen that, for example, nomadlist.com is out of date. For example, in Medellin, where I have lived the last four years mostly, there are many groups where you can ask you questions and there's a huge community helping you out. Another amazing place where you can find information is actually here on YouTube. You just Google like digital nomad life in Medellin in Changu, in Lisbon, in Cape Town, and there are so many videos talking about exactly those things. And another last budgeting tip from my side, stay longer in one destination. By actually staying three months in one destination, you will save so much money because you don't have to travel to a new destination, to another country. You have leverage while negotiating for a better rate on Airbnb or for other apartments. There are many ways because you will actually not move around every day. You will try to get into a routine within your new destination and you will spend automatically less money. So honestly, if you stay one month in the city, you can maybe spend 1,500 US dollars. But if you spend three months in the city, you will maybe fall to an average of 1,100 US dollars per month. Keep that in mind because that's actually a very good recommendation. After knowing your budget, we can finally talk about new countries or destinations. Now it's time to see, do I need a visa? How long can I stay legal in the country? Can I extend maybe my visa while being there? For example, in Colombia, you can extend the 90 days you get while entering the country to another 90 days, so in total 180 days without having to leave the country. A very good page to recommend you to see where do I need a visa or not is www.passportindex.com. There you can click on your passport or on your nationality, open this page and see in a line all the countries where you need a visa, where you need an e-visa or you don't need a visa, all the information. But I'm also recommending you to always double check the information with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of your own country so that you really have the official and current information. Passport index is for example very good to have an overall view of the countries you might enter with an e-visa, no visa or how do you have to apply for the visa. Another very good recommendation is to always check the expiry date of your passport. When you're entering the country, your passport always has to be at least valid for another six months. 
If it's less than six months, the airline or immigration may deny you entering the country. Let's move on to accommodation. The accommodation can really influence your whole experience in a new country. If you're staying in a good place, in a good apartment, good neighborhood, you can be really happy within your first days. But if you move to a place you don't really feel safe or you don't feel comfortable, this will be very, very difficult and can make your country experience really bad. There are actually five ways where you can stay as a digital nomad while going to a new destination. You can have your own apartment. You can have a private room in a shared apartment. You can go to a co-living. You can go to a hostel or you can stay in a hotel. We will discuss now all the five accommodation types so that you know which one is actually made or perfect for me. Let's start with your own apartment. There are Airbnb, Verbo or Facebook groups where you can find your own apartment. Obviously, you will have your own privacy, you will have your own space, but for example, a disadvantage can be where do I meet new people? How can I make a new social life in my new destination? Another option is having a private room in a shared apartment. In your room you have your privacy, you have your own four walls, but you can already create a social life in your new destination and make friends and ask them questions about things you might need to know for your new place. You can find your private rooms at the same operators like Airbnb or Facebook groups. And actually you can also Google for places on Google where you can find roommates in your new destination. For example, in Colombia, it is compartoapto.com, which is sharingapartment.com. There you can find locally priced apartments or rooms to share and get to know locals. That's what I have been doing in my first two years in Colombia. I shared an apartment with local people. I learned the language. I had the opportunity to learn many more things about the place. And it's something I recommended. And another plus point is I paid local prices for the rent. So I paid around 150 to 180 US dollars per month. Everything included, furnished for a room in a very good neighborhood. So that's a very good point when you want to start your digital nomad career. Another option is going into hostel. Personally, I'm not a big fan of that because when I stay for a longer period of time in a place, I want to have my own room where it's not noisy, I want to have my own kitchen. But if you stay for a week or two in a new place, you can actually do it. There are many hostels actually made for digital nomads like Selena in Latin America, where you have co-working spaces, where you have really good infrastructure and you can meet like-minded people. Another way is co-living. What is co-living? That's actually also a shared apartment with a private room, but within those rooms you find other digital nomads. Also in those apartments there are normally designated working areas like a small co-working space where you can grow your career and work on your things. The last option is staying in a hotel. Obviously that's probably the most expensive way. You have no kitchen but you have your private room etc. There are not many people doing it. I personally maybe do it when I'm in a new place for four to five days only like switching to a new country. And if there's no good Airbnb or hostel, for example, that's an option. Also another recommendation is always negotiate your prices. Always. On Airbnb, when you put 28 nights in a booking, you normally get a one month discount. But trust me, if you talk to the owner of the apartment and say, hey, I really like your apartment, it's beautiful, it's actually what I've been looking for, but unfortunately it's out of my budget. Would you maybe consider giving me a better price if I stay two or three months in your apartment and pay everything up front? I would appreciate that a lot. Those words are magic. There are so many people actually willing to give you a better price. Another important part is before you book an apartment, always ask for a confirmation of the internet speed. If the owner says, hey, I have the best internet in town, this might be true because they have the best operator. But what does a good operator bring if they only have a package of five megabytes per second as internet speed? Guys, that's not enough. Look for apartments normally 20 megabytes per second or going up. Now let's talk about flights. Flights can be very expensive, but there are also many ways how to save so much money on flights. I will explain you now some typical ways on how you can save money while traveling to another continent and maybe adding even a country for free on your trip to your next destination. One of the most important topics are onboard tickets. What are onboard tickets? When you travel to a new country, in most of the places you will have to have a return ticket to show that you will really leave the country. Many airlines won't let you board the flight if you don't have a return ticket. So you can lose out on your current flight and you will have to buy a new flight. And on the internet you can find services like onboardtravel.com, bestonboard.com, etc. Services where they will buy for you a plane ticket which will be cancelled within 48 hours for free. You just have to pay the plan for 10 US dollars. Within 5 minutes you get the email confirmation with actually a real flight. The confirmation you receive, you can show while being at the checking counter and they will let you board the flight. 
and you have solved this problem for only 10 US dollars. Another thing I love so much are stopovers. What are stopovers? There are many airlines that are having their hubs, like Emirates in Dubai, Cathay Pacific in Hong Kong, Swiss in Zurich, TAP in Portugal. When you book flights with those airlines, you can actually stay for free in their countries. One of my examples is I stayed once in New York City and I had to go to Hong Kong to make the switch to Asia on my trip around the world. I compared the flights and I saw that Swiss is actually offering pretty decent prices and then I was comparing if I can make a stop in Switzerland for free to visit my family. Instead of paying 600 US dollars with a stop in Switzerland, I checked the multi-destination flight. I put in New York City to Zurich and Zurich to Hong Kong and I left two weeks between the two flights. And I only paid 450 US dollars instead of 600 and I have been able to stay for two weeks in Switzerland. There are airlines like Emirates, TAP from Portugal, Qatar Airways, Cathay Pacific that want you to stay in their country to support tourism. So they offer you cheaper flights if you make a stopover in their destinations and for example in Dubai they're offering sometimes even free hotels. Or That's the perfect way to add a new country while changing your continent. For example from North America going to Asia you can stop in Europe. For the booking process I always recommend to use comparison sites like Skyscanner, Google Flights, Kiwi.com or in German for example Swudu.com. There you can always compare the flights from all the different airlines, maybe with a few stopovers or with stops. On Skyscanner, a good tool to use is, for example, you put in your starting point, which is, for example, in my case now, Bogota, to anywhere. And then the page will check out the prices and compare them and show you where the next cheapest flight is going. Another way you can do is make your starting point, Bogota, for example, and let's say you're flying to New York City, but you're flexible with your dates. And then they will check out the prices for a whole month and then you can actually choose when the cheapest flights are. As a digital nomad, you mostly are very flexible and can choose the cheaper dates and actually save the money like that. So let's go now to the travel insurances. Travel insurance is maybe not the most interesting point to talk about, but it's very, very important. Depending on the country you are staying in, healthcare can be very, very expensive. If you have a big problem or something and you have no insurance, they maybe won't treat you or you will be in debt for the rest of your life or for the next 20 years. There are many horrible stories you can see on the internet and people saying please, please, please buy travel insurance. I have to admit, I've been traveling a lot without any insurance. I always regret it and I had to take a travel insurance as well, so please do that. I will introduce you now to the two most famous travel insurances for digital nomads. Number one is Safety Wing. Safety Wing is actually a travel insurance from nomads by nomads backed up by a huge insurance corporation from Tokyo in Japan. The good thing about Safety Wing is that they have a subscription model, which is like Netflix where you can cancel any month and you can start whenever you want, also when you are already traveling. It starts with around 40 US dollars per month, which is a very good deal. In the description right below this video, you can find a link with all the information about Safety Wing and their offer. Another good option is World Nomads. World Nomads is known as one of the best travel insurers all over the world and they are insuring your trips wherever you go. Always compare what is better for your needs Check out what they are covering, what they aren't covering, and then you can decide which is the best option for you. Also for World Nomads, right in the description below of the video, you can find the link with all the necessary information. Let's move on to the last point of this video, money. Withdrawing money can be so expensive, having bad conversion rates. This can really be a nightmare and be so annoying. Luckily, in 2022, there are some amazing options for travelers and for remote workers. They are called WISE and Revolut. Those are online banks having actually covered all the important things we travelers might need. Both operators are online banks actually specialized on frequent travelers. Why are they good and what makes them different? A very good part of both operators is that you can use them as a payment method for your freelancing career. Also with your local credit or debit card, you normally have to pay fees for withdrawing money at your home destination but also in your bank abroad. So normally on average you pay 10 US dollars only for withdrawing money. Both Wise and Revolut actually have agreements with many banks abroad so that they don't charge you at all for withdrawing money abroad. This can help you to save so much money by time. Another amazing part for both operators is that they are having the best conversion rates on the market. As they are specialized on people traveling the world constantly, they have to have a good offer for them. Another good and important recommendation for you guys, please, 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 always decline the offered conversion rate in your bank abroad. That's another way for the banks to make money. So for example, if they offer you 
to decline or accept a conversion, always decline. Why? That's another way how they normally take between 8 and up to 25% of your money. So if you withdraw money, you can actually one day make a comparison with what they have offered you and what is showing on your bank statement. Trust me, they are taking average around 15% and you are losing out on so much money. Two big operators, you have already forgotten maybe the names, no worries. Right down in the description below, you can find the links to both operators, compare them. There are also many good blogs comparing them and you can find out which offers the better things for you. So guys, we are reaching again the end of the video. In a few seconds, you will see a whole map of things we have been talking today and then you can make a screenshot to take away all the important parts of today's video. I hope you have learned a lot in today's video. If you have learned a lot and enjoyed it so far, please hit the subscribe button, leave a like or a comment. Anything is very appreciated and it helps me to grow this channel. Thank you very much. See you in the next one.